I'm sorry, guys. Luigi, thank you for saving me. So, I saved it in two resolutions. Um, so, uh, which one do you prefer? Uh, I don't know. 16 by 9 and 14 by 3. I guess it's the same. Well, this will be the one I think distributed. The one that we use? Distributed for the other people. Yeah, it's the one that uh, will be on the website. So, for the so, so which one three? Uh, just take uh, one for the computer, which is better. So maybe the okay. doesn't doesn't the resolution. Yeah. So this means it's very difficult. Okay. I'm really sorry. I see that people are inter interested, but we have. Oh just no no I know I know you guys speech. gotta go. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Uh, you know it's uh, we recorded on the YouTube. Okay. Also, I mean we may, we. We missed the thing. Well, maybe the some of the questions yeah. will not be heard. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. But the guys were so about what was it? <laughs> kind of <laughs> maybe. Thank you so much. This is like. Uh, uh, this is yours. This is Luigi's. Luigi's. Yes, this is mine. Okay. Luigi, thank you so much. No. For my part. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, what what is mine? This one is yours. Did you get the sticker? I did not. What is the sticker? Thank you so much. And now they hear me. Yeah. Try to say something. Like test. Yeah. Okay. okay. Is it? Yeah. Keep it pushed. I think it. I don't know. Try. It. No. <laughs> it's inter something intermediate. Yeah, there is another microphone over there.
Okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, cool. So, hello everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Mirka Stransky, this is Marios Andreu and Giulio Fidente. We work on the Triplo project, which is a project for installing and managing uh, OpenStack clouds. And uh, we're among the people who implement updates and upgrades there. So that's what, what's, what we're going to talk about today. So first, uh, I'm going to do just a short uh, deployment uh, structure recap, uh, just to, to ensure that uh, we all have a common base for talking about the up updates and upgrades. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the upgrades and updates in OpenStack in general. And there are some specific differences uh, in OpenStack between up major upgrades and minor updates, um, pretty defined. So we're going to mention those. Then uh, we're going to talk about how updates are specifically implemented in Triple O and some of the issues that we faced uh, while uh, implementing the update support. And then we're going to show a demo video uh, with a nice, like, how, how does it work that uh, tenants have preserved uptime of their virtual machines during the update. So the deployment structure. Uh, this is the overcloud. This is uh, the cloud where tenant VMs run. And it's a like a simplified deployment, and it's a simplified view of that deployment, just to have uh, the basis for talking about updates and upgrades. Uh, there are three controller nodes to ensure high availability. Uh, there's pacemaker cluster in it to control the services and help with the high availability. On each controller, they, there are APIs, RESTful APIs, which users uh, use to uh, talk to the cloud and perform management operations on it. Uh, and there are databases which are uh, clustered together uh, to uh, store persistent data. And there's AMQP message, uh, message bus to uh, facilitate communication between the controllers and also between the uh, computes and between controllers and computes. So for the upgrades, this is the more uh, general case, uh, the major version upgrades. Uh, when you do a major version upgrade in OpenStack, the database schema uh, of the services can change. And AMQP uh, messaging, which is used for RPC between the nodes, can change as well. Uh, that means that you have to upgrade controllers in parallel because uh, currently the services can only talk to the database sch schema or work with the database schema that they expect just specifically for their version. Uh, so that means that you have a cloud management down downtime. You're going to have to t take down the controller services for some time to perform the update and uh, DB schema migration. Uh, but that doesn't impact the, like the tenant VMs. They still keep running. And you can upgrade, upgrade com computer, computes in a series. In fact, you should to be able, again, to preserve tenant uptime. Uh, and you can also do it in batches, de depending how much free capacity you have in your cloud. You can do that because the compute nodes, the compute service itself doesn't have any direct database connection, so it can, can't have any uh, expectations about the DB schema. And for RPC over the AMQP bus, you can do pinning. So each version uh, supports communicating in its own RPC protocol and also in one version older protocol. Uh, you can also do service by service upgrade. That doesn't get you rid of the downtime. You're just going to spread it, the down, down, downtime uh, by different services. Um, we considered moving to a more service-based uh, management uh, rather than the current 
role-based management in Triple So this is what we might do in the future. But for, for now, we're uh, focusing on the uh, global synchronized upgrade. So if we were to look at the workflow, uh, first, we would uh, pin the Nova RPC, ensuring that we can now uh, have uh, controllers of a newer version, while computes can be also of the newer version or of, or of the older version, and it, they can still talk to each other. So once we have the Nova RPC, the Compute Service RPC pinned, uh, we're going to shut down the cluster uh, of the services on controllers. Uh, then we can do the package updates, and uh, if there was some uh, reason to reboot, like a kernel update, we can reboot the nodes. And then w once the nodes are back up, we're going to start the databases first, perform the DB schema, scheme, schema update in the databases. After that, we can start the remaining uh, services on the controllers, at which point the cloud starts, again, respond, so responding uh, to the management operations and performing them correctly. Uh, then we can do package updates on the computes. We can do it uh, in series or all at once. That doesn't really matter that much. Restart the uh, Nova compute services on them. And if some of the computes need a reboot, that's sort of... Uh, an added complexity there, sort of an interesting case. Uh, you need to reboot uh, only empty compute uh, nodes because otherwise you would, if, if you obviously if you uh, reboot a compute node where there's a tenant VM running, that's a problem for the tenant. So what Nova can do, uh, so first you're gonna remove the, uh, like the batch of the nodes or at least one node from Nova scheduler, which ensures that uh, new VMs being asked, like if someone asks to uh, schedule a new VM in the cloud, it's not going to get scheduled on this particular batch of compute nodes. Then we live migrate the VMs from the compute nodes away uh, to some other compute nodes which are not uh, part of the update batch or upgrade batch. Uh, then we can reboot the compute nodes to make the kernel update uh, take effect, and then we can add the nodes back to scheduler. And we sort of uh, do those batches and until, until we have restarted all the nodes that needed a restart. And once we're done with that, we do a, an unpin of the Nova RPC and uh, your cloud is upgraded to the next major version. So minor version updates, um, they are sort of less um, intrusive to the cloud because OpenStack, um, like by convention, guarantees that database schemas will not change. Uh, and IMQP messaging either does not change or is backwards compatible, meaning that uh, you can uh, minor upgrade, a minor update, anything, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to still be able to communicate with the old, older version, no problem. So the challenge here uh, is in uptime expectations, because that means you're able to do a uh, completely rolling upgrade of everything. Uh, and uh, that's what the operators expect. Uh, and they expect that there's going to be no tenant downtime, uh, even for the controller part. So uh, we do the rolling updates on the controllers, where we uh, rely on Pacemaker, because some of the more complicated services like uh, databases and the message queue, for example, have a specific set of actions that should be performed while uh, leaving or rejoining the cluster of those nodes. So Pacemaker has that implemented in so-called resource agent, which can deal with this for us really nicely. And then we again do the normal package update on the computes. So let's look at the workflow again. Um, we go sequentially over the controllers. We take one out of cluster, stopping all services there. We do the package update and then uh, reboot the node uh, if needed. And then we let it rejoin the cluster uh, utilizing Pacemaker, as I, as I said, the resource agent. Uh, and then again, the compute procedure is essentially the same. Uh, we do 
updates on all com computes, uh, can do them either at the same time or in batches. And then we perform the same um, reboot procedure as we had before, uh, which includes the removing from scheduler, live migrating VMs away, rebooting the now empty compute node and adding it back to scheduler. And that's how a minor update is performed. Now this is like a very high level theoretical view. In practice, obviously things get a, a little bit more complex. So I'm gonna uh, give the floor to Marios to talk about the implementation details uh, of updates in Triple O. Hello, hi, can you hear me okay? Hey, thanks. Okay, so, hello. Um, okay, I don't know how many of you were in uh, Steve Hardy's talk earlier. Um, so, I'll do a little bit of a recap on the terminology here. So, this is, um, so the undercloud down here and the overcloud up here is, is is this something that people in this room have heard before, apart from the triple O people, of course? Um, is this something you're familiar with or not at all? Maybe? Okay, so what happens is in, in triple O, we have two clouds, effectively. We have the under cloud, which is what we stand up, the initial cloud, and that's what we use to manage the actual end user cloud, which, it, which we call the over cloud. Um, the under cloud down here is effectively an, a single node cloud, and that's where we run the director node. And this diagram actually shows the setup, as in this is um, what we, you know, this is what we do for the updates. This is this is the setup that we have. We have um, a overcloud with our, you know, control nodes, which are running in a pacemaker cluster uh, to manage all the services. We have our compute nodes, which are hosting the tenant VMs. But it also also shows the goal, which is what we you know this is what we want to work towards. And the goal is that with your tenant VMs up here, the director you know from the director node, an operator can come in, do a simple CLI command, yum update, um, and that will then go away and take each of the nodes in the overcloud sequentially one by one. We'll see how that works in a moment in a little bit more detail, um, and update them. And the expectation is that there is very little downtime for um, end, end user VMs. Um, in practice, from, you know, from our, our setups, from our dev setup and our testing, it was in the order of about 10 seconds. Um, you would lose like two pings, three pings, while you're pinging the, the 10 VMs. And this is while the updates are, are happening, which, which we think is, is acceptable. Um, <clears throat> Okay, that's, I think that's, that's it for this slide. Okay, so we start the update. So the idea is that operator goes on the management node. Um, Steve spoke a little bit also earlier about the, the uh, plugin that we have to the, the OpenStack um, CLI. Uh, and instead of before, Steve spoke about uh, OpenStack over cloud deploy. Here we're doing OpenStack over cloud update. Um, the overcloud is the name of the cloud that we're updating, and then we pass in the templates and the environment files, uh, which have to be the same for the update as what you had initially deployed. And the two main things that we rely on here are um, setting a pre-update hook um, on each node. What that means in practice is that it, allow, it basically it sets a breakpoint, okay? And the whole point of this is we only want one node to be updated at any given time. I mean, this is especially important. I mean, it's important for all the nodes, but especially um, for the controllers where we want to uh, maintain the high availability. When we're maintaining essentially a slightly degraded high availability because if you're starting off with three controllers and you take one of them out, I mean, you're left with two controllers. It's still HA, but there's, there's no quorum. You know, if, if one of them fails, for example, then you're, you know, you're kind of in a, a bad position. Um, so slightly degraded, but still HA. <clears throat> and also, the way we control whether a, node, a given node is going to be updated at a given time is by setting this update identifier. And effectively, this is just a, a, a timestamp or you know, just a, a parameter, a variable, 
which we will set for a given node so that when it comes to updating that node, if the update identifier is set, and this is via the, the heat templates that we use to deploy in Triple O, um, that node will get updated. Uh, otherwise, it just gets skipped. Um, I'll, we'll speak a little bit more about what does the actual uh, updating in a moment. But uh, this is just to show that you know, the, the two kind of features that we rely on here is the, the heat native feature to, to do the, the breakpoint one by one update of the nodes. Uh, we control whether a given node is going to get updated or not by setting this update identifier. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit now about what happens on the compute node um, and then a little bit more about what happens on the controller node. So the compute node is, is the simplest case. It's the simplest case because there's no pacemaker. Um, the, the main things that are running there are the Nova compute and the agents. So we have like the OVS agent, we have accelerometer agents. Um, so effectively, we don't, you know, we don't have to worry about um, bringing the pacemaker cluster down on that node or taking the node out of the cluster, for example. Um, we just, um, you know, once we've made sure that we, we don't have anything um, you know, running on, on that, well, okay, so, Yirka spoke a little bit about rebooting um, the compute nodes. Um, we didn't actually do that in a great detail. The, that was the one case that we didn't test too much for the, the, the rebooting. But OK, so the simple case is um, we just update all the packages on that node, and then you know, it, 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 you go on to the next one. So for the compute node, it, it, it's much simpler. For the controller, it's, it's more interesting. Okay, um, So here, we first need to bring the cluster down, so we take the controller out of the cluster. We need Pacemaker to be in maintenance mode for the duration of the update. Once um, all the services are stopped OK on that node, then we run a yum update. Um, once the yum update is finished, we put the controller back into the cluster, and we go on to the next one. Um, this reference here, the second point about matching the pre and post update environments, uh, that's something that Julio is going to speak a little bit more about um, because it was a, an issue that we, it was one of the bugs that we hit, in fact, because we had a, a change in the pacemaker constraints from what we had initially deployed to what we were updating to. So we needed those to match um, for the update to work correctly. Um, okay. Um, okay, so this is how we actually deliver the updates is, is, a, is basically just the bash script. Um, it's called yumupdate.sh, and it's delivered as the config property of a heat um, software deployment. This is so software config. Um, as Steve said earlier, you know, within heat, you can have this uh, you know, software config which runs an arbitrary uh, code on your, on, you know, on your chosen node. It can be Python or you know, whatever you need to run there. And in this case, we're using a bash script. And if you like, um, afterwards, if we have time at the end, we can even look. I mean, it, this is all obviously uh, open source. It's all upstream. Um, you can go on GitHub, and you can actually see this script. Um, and, and you can see that you know, all the logic that we've described here. If it's a controller, you do this stuff. You bring the cluster down. You wait till everything is down. Run the update. You know, set the maintenance mode for Pacemaker. Run the update. Bring the services back up. Make sure everything is, uh, the, the cluster is settled, and then on to the next node. Um, Yum update, the very first thing it does is checks that update identifier. Um, if the update, the update identifier by default is empty, it's just an empty string. If it's not set to a timestamp, which is what we're using currently, I think, um, then nothing happens on that node. So the update identifier is set on the given node that we want to update at the given time. Um, and then the yum update.sh contains just that logic. You know, bring the pacemaker cluster down, run the yum update, and then bring, it, bring um, Pacemaker back up on that node. Bring all the services back up on that node with Pacemaker. Um, OK, so Julio is now going <laughs> to tell us about all the things that could possibly go wrong. Well, some of them, anyway. I mean, in theory, it sounds very easy, but there were a lot of subtle things that we had to deal with. Thank you. Can you kind of hear me? Yeah. Ah, sorry, it's a bit. So, uh, I'm Julio. So, what could possibly go wrong? We have a plan, and we have an implementation, and we have bugs. So, uh, like every software that I've seen. Uh, and the, the interesting thing about talking about the bugs is that uh, we learn a lot from the bugs. I get to deal with bugs a lot. So. These are not just the four bugs that we hit, are just more like 
four different type of bugs that we had to face and that we had to deal with. And so they kind of go into different areas and they also are, um, they will show how, my, how, how far we had to reach, especially in taking help from other people to get all the things to work. And uh, so the, the four different types, let's see. One is what I'm calling the tooling bugs. It's just issues in the tooling that we use to run the update. So not uh, tools that we manage by ourselves, but tools like Heat that Steven actually introduced before us. And another type of issues is bugs in the workflow. So bugs in the way we have implemented the update, which is actually causing troubles that we didn't think about in advance, or at least that we didn't think uh, correctly during the planning part. Then there are what I call subtle bugs, <laughs> which are problems caused by existing bugs or maybe old bugs in the actual components that we are trying to update. So not in the tooling that we use, not in the workflow, but just components not behaving as they should when they are performing the update. And evil bugs, so those which we introduce it by ourselves, the worst ones, right? The ones that we feel responsible about more than the others. The first one, uh, it's just, it looks like a, an easy issue. Uh, we have each and every resource of our overcloud. Well, we have a, a representation of each and every resource of the overcloud in Heat, including the networks. So Heat, uh, Steven at some point said, that we have network isolation, so we have multiple networks and multiple sub-networks in the undercloud Neutron, which are actually matching the uh, physical networks of the overcloud. And he had a very nice feature that introduced uh, during, you know, uh, after our initial release, <coughs> which allowed us to refer to networks by their names rather than their IDs, and we decided to take advantage of this feature. So. In the initial release, we were re referring to the networks from their IDs. Then in the next release, we were referring to the same network by its name. And we expected it to do the mapping correctly, and they surely were also. But it wasn't working as expected, so we ended up with the overcloud, you know, deleting and then creating a network which was causing cascading issues, which so we had to go to actual heat experts, Steve in this case, <laughs> who not only had to fix the bug, in the master version, but also to backport it to the stable version, which we were trying to update to, right? So there's twice the work because it's on the master and it's also the backporting phase. We, we want the feature to work in the version that we are updating to, otherwise we're, you know, we, we can't actually take advantage of the feature. The other bug <laughs> that I had in the list, it's a kind of, well, very different area, but not, you know, not, really in the tool itself. So we, have use, we use Pacemaker in the controllers, and Pacemaker is doing its job as we want it to. And uh, it has a sort of um, <coughs> graph representation of the services so that it has some understanding of which one depends on each other. And during the update, as they were describing, we need to do some controlled shutdown of the services so that they get down in a cleanly manner and we can take out one node from the cluster without the other behaving you know, unexpectedly. And the problem is we had a, a problem in, in our constraints, right? In, in, what, in what represents this graph in Pacemaker. So we were unable to do a clean shutdown of the services. The problem was kind of, you know, we knew about the problem, we just updated the constraints in the newer release, but we were running the update, so we needed the shutdown before the update itself. And so we were actually going through the graph before it was updated to the working version, which means we were running through the graph in the, bro in the broken version. Uh, and this is why I call it a workflow problem, because we had to perform a matching of the pre and post update of the constraints before the actual update was started, before the actual YAM update could start. This time, HA people helped. One of the guys is there on the first desk, Mikael, <laughs> and uh, you know, he helped us figure what was the proper graph to put into Pacemaker to make all the flow work as expected. Another one, uh, sorry, another bug, again, which needed help from other people, and this time from Neutron course. I don't know if there is anybody from Neutron in the room or not, but 
so we, we finally got hit to behave as we want to. We got the constraints in place as we need before the update, actually. We run the update. The software is updated as we want it to, but we also need to preserve the guest's connectivity. And we figure that something is wrong, like guests are not working <laughs> during the update. Uh, what I, th this is actually a problem in Neutron, and uh, it took us probably a day to figure <laughs> before we could reach the appropriate people. Um, and it turns out to be a bug which was fixed in Neutron, but not in the version that we were coming from. A very simple bug, it was just um, the key we, we use a feature from Neutron which allows for H availability of the L3 IP, so of the float of the agent which is running as the L3 router. And this is implemented by having multiple copies of keep LID running on all nodes. So during the what we s hoped to be a clean shutdown, Neutron was not correctly killing one of these keep LID instances. So the actual IP was not relocated over the other. This was not a problem with Pacemaker. This was actually a problem with how the thing was implemented in Neutron. So again, we had to put in place a workaround which was distributed on the nodes through heat before the actual update could take place because we really needed the IP you know, to relocate before the update so that the guests wouldn't lose connectivity. And then another area again, the evil area, the area where we are responsible for. for <laughs> and uh, so update is complete, hit worked as expected, pacemaker did the shutdown, Neutron did the relocation, the guests have connectivity, everything seems fine. And yet there is people testing this after the update and they are doing basic stuff like you know scaling the cloud after the update and it's not scaling anymore. Like how is it that it was working and it's not working anymore? And this is probably, I forgot it in the slides, excuse me, but this is actually the update identifier that Marius was talking about because you know, Heat tries to be clever about when it's necessary to update the resources and when it's not. We just forgot to distribute the update identifier <laughs> to the tool which was setting the maintenance mode and stuff. So on the first attempt, on the, on the moment when the resource was created, it was doing what we expected. But at the moment when the resource was updated, it wasn't because the update identifier was not changing. Um, it took probably more time to get to a working implementation than to do the initial implementation. So, I mean, just to give an idea of how much we spent to get it working. But we have a video now, right? Because finally it did work. So let's see the video and how, and how it actually, you know, works. Thanks. So, I mean, just one last thing on this, on this slide. Um, one of the reasons we had this here was to, to call out, I mean, yeah, as, as Julio said, it was evil, it was kind of subtle, because the update was successful. You know, it, the update was complete, the, the cloud was working, um, the tenant VMs were fine, and this was to call out some of the work that people like uh, Marius Cornet up there and the, the testing guys were doing, because, you know, they, they really tested it. I mean, even after everything was working fine, they, they put it through its paces, they tried scaling, adding, and, and removing nodes, and things like this showed up so sorry about that um so i'm gonna try i'm gonna attempt to show the video um unfortunately i mean with the updates it takes so long it's really not feasible to can you hear me okay yeah it's really not feasible to do a, a live demo i mean it, even with a a very small setup of three controllers and, and a compute take the best part of at least an hour at least i mean to get the the whole update through um um why <laughs> So hold on. Um, so okay, this the video is not great. I don't know how well it's going to work, but I'm gonna I'm gonna skip through, and I'm gonna because we're we're also almost at time for the half hour to leave some time for questions. The main thing I want to demonstrate here is the router failover, really, uh, to to show. Well, the main thing I want to demonstrate is how the tenant VMs remain available, and they kind of go down, or you lose two pings. Um, throughout this whole process. Okay, so I've got some times here on my phone which I'm going to skip to. Um, <clears throat> okay, so initially, let's go to here. Um, 
Okay, so, oh, actually, hold on, sorry about that. Yeah, okay, let's start right at the start. So, okay, this is, this is the setup, okay? Um, at the top there, we've got the heat stack list. So you see I've got a, I've got a heat stack deployed. I've got my overcloud deployed. It's create complete. Um, there's four nodes involved here. So you see the ironic nodes, and you see the Nova instances at the bottom corresponding to, to those nodes. Um, so we've got three controllers in HA, uh, controlled by the pacemaker, and we've got the, the one compute in this setup. And then I'm going to skip to here to show you what's happening on controller zero. So this is <coughs> a terminal into controller zero. The output you're seeing here, uh, again, I mean, you don't really need to see, you know, well, okay, it's pretty bad, but I'll try and point at things. What this is showing is an IF config on the uh, Neutron router namespace, okay? And the main thing I want to show is this line here, which shows that the, the tenant router IP <coughs> is currently being hosted by this controller, okay? So it's on controller zero. And we'll see in a moment that when this particular node gets updated, that IP goes from here and gets failed over to one of the other controllers. It's not being updated, okay? And that means that you can still get to your tenant VMs which are being hosted on your compute node. Um, okay, so let's go to where the update starts so you can see what the CLI looks like in practice. Um, so, okay, so this is what, what the operator would do on the, on the director node, you know, open stack, over cloud update stack, and, and begins the update. And this will, you know, start, pick one of the machines, um, based on, you know, the breakpoints, pick one of the machines and start updating that one. So let's go to a first break breakpoint to show you. So, yeah, actually that's here. So you can see, hold on, go back slightly. Uh, yes. Okay, so that will come up in a moment. So you see here, that's hit a breakpoint, and it's picked controller two. Um, I think this is, yeah, so it's picked controller two here. It's waiting for some input from the operator. You want to start this, updating this controller, you say yes, and it starts running the update on controller two. Uh, I'm going to actually skip forward here to where it's, updating controller zero, so we can see the, the router failover. Um, actually, before, I, yeah, I'll do that. Uh, so go to seven. Okay, so th the text is very small here, but what this is showing is that, I mean, I've got, I, 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 may, I, I intentionally made the text much smaller here because I didn't want you to see so much what was written, but the fact that, the, this is a growing list of services which are pacemaker. This is, this is the output of PCS status. So this is your, the status of your, your pacemaker cluster. And it's showing that on controller zero, because it's being updated now, all the services are coming down. So this list grows with services which are coming down on that particular controller. Okay? Uh, and I will skip to this point where you can see now that this is controller zero, which remember, this is the one that was hosting our um, tenant router at this point now and this is hold on okay so this is controller zero and then we'll see here how the IP will appear on so you see the the cursor in the video is oh, damn it. <laughs> sorry <laughs> okay here um, this is controller zero you see the router IP is still on there and then it, it's gone. It's gone from there, and it just appeared on controller one. Okay, so it fails over. And what that means is on the, if you see where we're pinging the overcloud tenant um, instances, you, hold on, I need to just find this one point, and then I promise I will leave some time for questions. <laughs> yeah, so this is, this is what I want to show you here. Uh, throughout this process, we're pinging the tenant VMs. You know, ping, 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 and it's fine. Those two unreachables is the time it takes for that router failover to happen. So in practice, it's about in the order of 10 seconds of, of you know, downtime, well, not being able to reach, not even downtime, not being able to reach your tenant VMs. Um, yeah. So that's the demo video, and I think we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Any questions?
Yeah, that's that's a very good question. The question was, um, do we do any validations on the update? So, the, so right now, not. There has been some work. So Steve has done some work on checking the heat resources. Is that right? The the pre and post update heat resources matching. Yeah. So right now we do have this simple checking of the heat resources, but I mean the the actual validations and and uh, doing more comprehensive validating of your environment, and that would apply not just to to the post update environment. It would apply. I mean, it's something you would use in general to the cloud that you've deployed. I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, so I wanted to say one thing. It's if it's about the configuration, if the question is about the configuration, we use Puppet, which you know is meant to enforce the state. So if Puppet succeeds, then you can either have the exact configuration you had before, or you may even have updated the configuration, so slightly changed something. And if Puppet is okay, then I mean, that's our first guarantee that something okay. actually happening. If the question is more about the you know the versions of the packages which you have because this was actually running on CentOS mm -hmm. in the demo then no but I think there are probably other tools which fit better the 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 scope of okay so can you mention any any tools for let's say deployment validation the update validation that is actually still valid and you can say like it's working even the scaling up you know it's working. So how would you validate it? Oh, so like Tempest or what I, what, I'm not sure what, what, what is on your, on your. <laughs> I'm thinking about the Tempest too, but uh, yeah. But like in a lightweight version or, or. Okay, so. It's a good idea though to. to use to Tempest. Yeah, it's a good idea to use either Tempest or a subset of the existing so tests in Tempest. The, the idea is that there's gonna be a couple of different levels. I mean, it's going to be the idea. The vision is that we're going to have a pluggable yeah, um, validation uh, implementation that you can write your own validation for. But I mean, just to point out, there's a couple of levels of validation. I think you're talking about validating that your cloud works. But there's also things like validating the inputs, validating yeah. the conflict well, between I, I the fronts. The Tempest is more like for the developers, right? No. Or it's for the yeah, so one of the <coughs> sorry. No, no. So one of the options would be Tempest again, or uh, we have actually a couple of people working on a uh, external validation tool, external to heat. Uh, I'm not aware that it's been integrated into RDO yet. I don't think it has, but there's some work on it. Or and there's another option. Uh, Ladia Smola had a talk before uh, showing uh, CloudForms integration with uh, the uh, director or manager, uh, and he had this checks there uh, built in for, th for, the, for the package versions, for example, to verify that you're not vulnerable from shell shock or, uh, or bugs like this. So the other option would be to integrate with something like Manage IQ. I don't think there is, and I'm not sure how would we implement it really. Like you can all, of course, you can do backups and then roll back uh, manually from some backups. But once you do a YAM update and do a bunch of config changes, uh, do the database migrations, those, as far as I know, those aren't reversible by by themselves. So you would really need to do like a complete right, rollback. That's I think. for upgrades, but I mean even in the updates for the <coughs> database. Because we're not changing versions for the updates, but even then, no, we don't currently know. Yeah, um,
Right, does okay. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. If you have a question, yeah, you can come. Thank you. Was it okay? Actually, yeah, yeah. the same it's question. So it's for the microphone was a bit. It's more yeah, for the recording, so not for the puppet here. It was fine. Oh, you think it was too low? The, um, no, well, the face when passing the microphone. Hello, and the, the I'm Mario. Yeah. I, I recognize your name, but we never met. So, yeah. how are you? How do you do? So, people actually are okay with upgrading their whole cluster. The you know what, man? This is all really new. The updates we worked on it in like November, and the upgrades we talked about it this week. No, but from business perspective. I would expect people, you know, let me upgrade two clusters, um, two computer like nodes, let me see if it's all work, and in a week's time, I'll completely upgrade. I'll yeah. see the customers are happy. Yeah. I mean, it's the, this but all or nothing I thing is like, whoa, yeah. scary. Yeah, that's true. Um, I mean, we can control, as you know, we have a way of controlling which nodes, and we can start with the, we start the process with a simple CLI, and you can control that during this process only one node will get updated. So you can, you can enforce that. I wouldn't even and you're right. right. It's possible, you know, just upgrade Cinder. The next week I'll but upgrade but Neutron. But, I know but, but there were also other approaches that we considered which would be safer in that respect. So, for example, instead of updating things in place, you bring up a, a parallel node and then just swap it. So, yeah, there's, which and again, is just as complex. This is all new stuff, man. Yeah, I mean, you mm -hmm. could go that way. The operator turns around and says, no, it's bullshit, but it's coming. You know? Is it deployed already in the field? So uh, the the updates, yeah. yeah, we have some yeah. customer uh, presentation. Oh, yes. Uh, you know what? It's, um, it's reveal.js. It's like HTML. Is it good for you? Okay. Yeah, yeah. We will put it on. Okay, I'll do it over here so we're not yeah, disturbing. Yeah. Nicola. It's uh, HA for So uh, you have 40 minutes for the, for the talk, including the Q&A session. It depends on you when you would like to stop. Basically, if you will keep talking, we'll notify you on the when there is 10 minutes left and 5 minutes left when you have our, when the time is up, we will stop you, basically. Okay. Here is our water. Um, yeah, uh, let's, let's set up the mic, clip it somewhere, and go for the door. I think that it's not a good idea because it would uh, wobble and uh, yeah. it, it, would, it would do that weird makes, sounds. Makes sense. Um, hmm. Is this better? Yeah, that would. Maybe, maybe a little closer, but... Hmm. Let me take the shot. So let's let's check. So let's check how it works. One two one two. <laughs> one two. Right. Check mic check. Right. So it works. Um, now it's on mute. Anybody would like to speak? Just un unmute it. Okay. Why doing this? Uh, right. So you can flip it for a flip it somewhere. Good. Mic so let me get a mic. Um, Let's connect the yeah, let's connect the laptop. Good. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, like Okay, great. Yeah, the other thing we have the remote control. So if you would like to use the you know, Extremely annoying. Uh, what's wrong? You can 
this thing captures a skate, which is also the... Uh, I remember speaking with some of the guys Can you use the remote if you want? No. Um, okay. So, is it this is a yeah, we have we have three scouts. I want to for you. Uh, so it's good. Good. So you, but you can reward the three best questions, and you can make uh, um, questions yeah. more popular. Okay. <laughs> That's so good. I will. So I have three scarves. Yes, yes, basically. Uh, and if you don't like somebody, you can just, you know. Yes. So here we prepared that for you. Thank you. So we can use it when you want to hear some question. Do you want us to introduce you? Yeah, what would you like? Uh, I have like a slide to introduce myself. So, so we should have my name. can just say my name. Okay. I will tell you that. Yeah, so we are like four minutes. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome Nikola Depano uh, Dipanov uh, from <laughs> from uh, Novak uh, OpenStack Novak Compute Engineering team. Uh, he will be having a talk on high performance VMs, so NUMA CPU pinning and large pages. So, welcome, Nikola. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming. So as as. As my introduction said, I will be talking about uh, high-performance VMs in, in OpenStack Nova. Um, a little bit about myself. I um, 
as many other speakers here work as a software engineer at Red Hat. Um, I've been working on OpenStack and Nova since 2012 and been a core developer since 2013. Um, so enough about me. Uh, so this is the overview of, of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, 